starting your day in Delft, then have a business lunch somewhere in Paris, then attend here the TEDx, TEDx Talks, and imagine now we all take the Hyperloop to Frankfurt, because in the end, uh, this, uh, this uh, night we want to go there, have some drinks in Frankfurt, probably watch a football match. And yeah, while you imagine that, I will explain you how this can become future daily routine. The world's all about transportation, about travel, right? Um, when I was a child, I always uh, sat for hours and hours and hours in the back of the car when we were going holidays. Or I remember my dad being often away on business trips to uh, Europe. And uh, he spent hours and hours in the plane while he also could have been at home. And for this transportation problem, we want to go further, easier, uh, we want to travel faster, cheaper, using the least amount of energy as possible. And for this transportation problem, we invented multiple things. We invented the car, we invented the, the, the train, we invented the plane, but can someone tell me when those last two pictures were made? Yeah, that's actually quite difficult, because for the last 50 years, you already have seen those machines flying or, or you boarded those trains. Actually, the, this Boeing 747 is still used by KLM, and it was already introduced in 90, 1967. So yeah, that's quite long. So it's really time for next step in the transportation world, time for innovation. Transportation is super congested. It's energy efficient and it's prone to external influences. One small snowflake or a leaf on the, on the railway track can completely burn down an entire transportation system. And transportation hasn't become faster. So in the 50s, it would have taken you two hours and 45 minutes uh, to go from the west to the east of the Netherlands. And right now, uh, what, what do you think? Right now, 70 years later, and yeah, previously I always could have said that it's one minute slower, but actually it was fact-checked by, by the NRC, so now I have to say I probably don't agree, but it's only half an hour, half an hour faster right now. So yeah, where is that innovation in 70 years? And now comes a way more shocking picture, and always when I show this picture, I check it first on the website of the European Economic Area, because yeah, it shows the, uh, the carbon dioxide exhaust over the last 30 years for different industry sectors uh, within Europe. And what you can see here, that is in all sectors, the carbon dioxide exhaust is diminishing, but for transportation, it's still increasing. That's weird, right? And why? Why can't we go faster and why can't we go cleaner? Yeah, that's a very basic reason. It's resistance. It's resistance from air. If you want to go really, really fast, you start pushing a column of air in front of you and resistance of flat tires. So, what's the basic solution? Yeah, that's levitating in a, in a tube, in a vacuum tube. And in such a tube, you almost have no resistance. So that means pumping down a tube to 0.1% of the air pressure. So then it's actually not, that's not that difficult. If, we, if I would say have said zero, pretty difficult. But 0 0.1 is doable. And yeah, because there's almost no, almost no resistance left, you only need a linear motor or a motor in the beginning to accelerate your pod. And then you can ex coast for kilometers and kilometers to the end, to your destination. And in the end, you would have a diff and also a motor reversely engineered, and you can regenerate a lot of energy. And that makes the Hyperloop immediately one of the fastest modes of transportation, but also the cleanest one, the using the least amount of kilojoules per kilometer. So that's funny, right? It, it seems uh, quite, quite positive news. And yeah, even better news, you could travel from Amsterdam to Paris, for example, within 30 minutes. So if you would live in Amsterdam, and uh, yeah, uh, and, and there's a Hyperloop to Paris, it would be, for example, make more sense for you to work in Paris, to have a job in Paris, than some, somewhere close by in Permagent or Flevoland, which is not connected yet to the Hyperloop system. So you want to be connected to that system in the end, and you could 
yeah, you could imagine right now we are also thinking of a, a mega city in which you, uh, you connect Amsterdam, Paris, and Frankfurt, so Ruhrgebiet, Randstad. You connect it together to one economic power zone. And in the end, in tens of years, it will take long, you could have a Hyperloop subway-like network all over Europe. And Europe could be one big city. Yeah, this is a really, really, really bright future. And of course, the path to that future is, is very long. The idea already exists for hundreds of years. This is a guy in London who actually uh, built or designed the track um, and also appears in, in future series. When I was younger, I, I watched this on TV and I had no idea that this was called a Hyperloop. But apparently, they think this is a Hyperloop. And now, uh, the idea was revived by Elon Musk. Now, I study in Delft, and in Delft, Elon Musk is, is the god for us. He is the founder of SpaceX, the landing rockets. He has a Tesla cars. He does cool stuff. He does solar cities, so solar panels. He does, does everything. And now, he also thought, ah, Hyperloop, pretty cool idea. And he decided to build, randomly build, a tube of 1.2 kilometers, half scale, one of the largest vacuum chambers in the world, just on the road in front of his rocket factory in California. And he said, yeah, let's try this. And he, he, he built this in a few months. And then he challenged students in the way of competition to build the vehicles which go inside. And yeah, many universities over the world applied for this competition. And of course, Delft was also in. And Delft, there are lots of students' teams who work on crazy projects like related to modes of transportation, the fastest rockets, or yeah, highest ro rockets going as high as possible, fastest solar cars, solar boats, uh, fastest bike in the world. And now the fifth mode of transportation is also being developed there. And that's the Hyperloop. And one year ago, the first Hyperloop team in Delft, ah, ah, I, I wouldn't say out of the blue, but it was still quite, quite a big achievement they had made. They, they won that competition. They beat it MIT, they beat it universities all over the world. And now uh, that challenge, that Hyperloop challenge has become even bigger. Because we want to show that speed, right? We want to show that promising speed of the Hyperloop. So, in a 1.2 kilometers tube, we want to go as fast as possible next year. And that means that we have to beat, uh, for example, Tesla, they also build a pod, Hyperloop One, and we have to beat that, that current world record of 384 kilometers an hour in a, such a small tube, such a small distance. And that means that we need to build something new, completely new, completely from scratch, completely new to ourselves. We also still have to learn a lot completely new to the world, and we want to do that in one year. Now, almost every person who we ask to help or companies to say, oh, one year, ah, oh, it's not possible. Go to someone else. It's, that's really, it's really a challenge. And the ingredient, the most important ingredient is this, in this, is our team. And uh, yeah, with 37 of us, we stopped our studies for a year. Most of us stopped their studies for a year. And uh, yeah, that's, that, that's already nice to stop for your, your studies for a year. I would advise everyone to do that. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, from all over the world, from different backgrounds, cultures, from 11 countries, there's someone in the back, even from Chile, and uh, five continents, uh, all different disciplines within the TU Delft, a very multidisciplinary. High multidisciplinarity, uh, aerospace engineers, electrical engineers, architectural engineers, we have everything in our team. And we gather uh, in our own building and an old chemistry facility. And here's where the magic happens. <laughs> Here is where we work for hours and hours. And uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy to see all that energy and that enthusiasm combined here behind the desk for the four, first few months, we were always behind our desktop, designing, researching, and um, yeah, making simulations, drawings, drawings and drawings, some rapid prototyping. And yeah, we spent 50,000 hours in narrowing down our design from a 
completely new sketchy design till designed three months uh, design three months later designed until the smallest washer with parts coming from all over the world together here in Delft. Here in Delft, we're deep in the night. We are the, on the point of finishing our design documentation, 600 pages, with which we want to convince SpaceX, and they are pretty, pretty precise, pretty difficult, uh, that we can actually build our pod and that we go there to California and do one of the first, or yeah, the fifth Hyperloop tests there. So I thought this was a nice picture to illustrate that. You see many people behind one desk where everything comes together. But when I took a closer look in the corner, <laughs> you, you could see uh, someone taking a, taking a power nap. <laughs> but yeah, little sleep and hard work paid off. We were out of many, many teams uh, selected as one of those 20 teams who can go there to California and actually build their pot. So that's what we are doing right now. We make most of our parts ourselves. And some people of us, yeah, they, they took it more radically. They actually moved somewhere else to a very remote place in the Netherlands, uh, to, to Flevoland. Uh, <laughs> I hope that, oh, this is recorded. Though. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and there uh, they, uh, they work, they live there for two months in houses like this. It's in Holiday Park, that's quite nice. And they, they work on our carbon fiber structures every day uh, from six to six. And uh, yeah, a few months later, on the 22nd of July this year, everything has to come together here in this tube in California. And this is where it all has to happen. Everything has to be perfect right there. And in only 15 seconds, this is very short, our entire year comes down. And in these 15 seconds, yeah, we either crash into thousand people, uh, thousand parts, because we, yeah, probably there are also some people behind the track, but I don't know. Uh, but in thousand parts, or we stay intact, and then those 15 seconds may be uh, a huge leap towards that fifth mode of transportation. And I, right now, I want to show you a short teaser of our design and of that fifth mode of transportation. Yeah, so um, yeah, we, we like to make epic, epic movies as well. Someone in our team did this in a few days. Just our design was finished and he had to make it in one week. Uh, but yeah, we, we also can't show too much of our design, but I want to show you a bit. Uh, yeah, this is, this is our launcher. That's one half of our design. And in this launcher, the, all the technique of the Hyperloop is focused. So this is the... The, the thing that will make it possible to uh, reach those high speeds in that small track, in that small tube. And, uh, and therefore, it's all about packing a huge power, a lot of energy, in a very, very lightweight pod. So we have an extremely uh, powerful propulsion, but as important is the braking in the end. Because if we don't brake, we have a very short braking time, if we don't brake, then we crash with very high speed. And that braking should be timed perfectly with the right force. Everything should work. And uh, yeah, that, that's one of the crucial points of our design. And that's also, yeah, we, in the 20th second of July, we press on the start button. And then it accelerates very fast. And then we have to, only thing we could do is hope that it breaks 50 seconds later. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and these so-called launchers will, in the end, transport uh, different capsules which you can put on top. And those capsules, 
those are the capsules that transport passengers or freight. And that can be based on the capacity demand. That can be based on or yeah, what, what you want. So you can have um, economy class passenger modules, business class, and cargo in the night. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I hope someone understands this joke. But you could also uh, deliver sensitive payload uh, Tesla would go to uh, outer space. And um, the beautiful thing as well is that in the end, those capsules could probably be integrated with already existing transportation systems. For example, with subway networks of cities, or even, why not, self-driving -dri cars, which go make the entire Hyperloop journey door to door. And hopefully, one day, you will have the, the courage to, to step in a, in a pod with an interior design like this, comfortable interior design, and you will walk to that station, to that Hyperloop station, and uh, yeah, right there, there's no such thing as waiting for your plane because it, yeah, your your my mom doesn't have to be stressed because we are not in time. It's uh, the Hyperloop pod will leave probably every minute or every two minutes, and you walk to your to the Hyperloop pod, and yeah, 18 minutes later, that's almost exactly as long as my TEDx talk right now lasted. You could have been there in Frankfurt and go to that football match. And yeah, we have seen, yeah, we have seen, it's almost a, yeah, it's a, a pretty good story with a lot of advantages. But I assure you, this is a huge infrastructure project and it will take many, many years. But for those fundamental advantages, yeah, you can really believe in, in a system like this, in a network like this. And how cool is it that we as young students at the top of our lives at an average age of 22, uh, I am actually 22 as well and not 20, <laughs> but uh, I'm a bit older, but probably it's good for the story. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, but how cool is it that we at, at that 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 time in our life, we, we don't go to, to courses or lectures, but we take on a challenge like this and we are completely independent and we are sitting there with 37 people and say, oh, what do we have to do now? No one knows what we have to do because it's completely new. And how cool is it that we can take on the challenge and that we can ask the help from and get the help from hundreds of people worldwide, specialists in specific parts we need. And how cool is it that we actually can stake, can decide, oh, we want to, to do this, and that we can stake that step towards the fifth mode of transportation. I would definitely advise every student, if there are any students in the room, uh, to, to, to take on such a challenge, to stop your studies for a year and do something completely different, and, to, and not only follow the lectures. And yeah, it's... Simply for me, it's so cool to be here and to, and to be able to, that we can tell in the end if such a transportation system is there, that we can tell our children, yeah, we pioneered in this. We, we are the pioneers of Hyperloop. Thank you.